you. So the first thing that, um, so now having in mind the blueprint of the uh, plan uh, of the proof, which is, uh, there is a first step in which uh, we want to define what are maps which are taking uh, more than one value and what is the delivery energy. Then there is a second step. We want to see why an area minimizing karma would be close to these maps, which take two values and minimize the energy. It was already possible to hear. OK, and then there is a third part in which we want to construct the center manifold, which is the average of the singular sheets. And then we want to see how, from the center manifold, we approximate, again, the current and find the contradiction if there are too many singularities in the current. OK, so the starting point is then to define what are multiple valued functions. So it's not that difficult if you think you have a domain that is a point x, which is varying, varying on the domain. And the map to each point x in the Euclidean space, in the subdomain of the Euclidean space, is associating q different vectors. So for instance, a typical two-valued map, it's going from c to c, and it gives you the two square roots of the complex vector. Okay? Now, for such a map, at the point 0, we just think that the two square roots are actually collapsed. So at the point 0, for such a map, we think that we are going to have two times the same value. Okay? So we can simply say a q-valued map is given by a q-tuple of unordered Euclidean vectors. Okay? Uh, and the map is assigning to each point x such a q-tuple. Now, a way to visualize this q-tuple is to build a measure. So let us say that we put a Dirac mass on each of these points. And so you can think as, uh, about the multiple-valued map x, uh, uh, f as associating to each x a measure which consists of Q Dirac masses. Now, the Dirac masses are always going to be Q, but it's not said anywhere that they cannot collide. So it might actually be that, the po that some of these points, some of these Q values are equal, OK? And then we have a collapsing situation. OK, now we want to put a metric on this. So what is the metric that we put naturally? So first of all, by notation, this funny notation over here will always be the Dirac mass with center pi. So a q-tuple is going to be written in this way. OK? Well, a metric that you can put of it is called uh, the two Wasserstein metric. It's, in a very, it's a variation of the Euclidean metric, if you want. So uh, it's an unordered, I mean, the, the q-tuples are unordered. So I, I don't know how to order them. But what I can do is that, for all possible orders of the q-tuple, I can construct a vector of dimension n times q, and then I can compute the Euclidean norm. And then I can minimize over all possible permutations, over all possible orderings. Okay? And you get this Wasserstein 2 metric. Now, of course, once you have this object, uh, uh, it's very easy to understand what is a Lipschitz function because you have an energy. It's very easy to understand what is a Hölder function, a continuous function. It's also very easy to understand what is a measurable function. But what is the Dirichlet energy? OK, so first of all, let us fix actually a Lipschitz map f before bothering about W12. I mean, ideally, you would like to define the Dirichlet energy for a C1 map. But also, we don't know what a C1 map is. OK, so let us fix actually the best approximation of a C1 map that we know in real analysis, and that is a Lipschitz map. And the Lipschitz map is only a metric concept. So we can define it on a metric space. OK, now we have the Lipschitz map, and we want to define the uh, Dirichlet energy. OK, so assume, for instance, you have a map which is taking two values. What can we do? Well, the first thing that we can do is we can argue geometrically. So if the map is taking two values, and it's Lipschitz, in particular, it's continuous, if at a certain point the map is taking two separate values, then in a neighborhood of that point, the Q-valued map separates, the two-valued map separates into two classical maps. OK, what I can do is I can take the Dirichlet energy of one map, the Dirichlet energy of the other map, and I can sum it. OK? Now, the set of points where you don't have collapsed values, so in which the two values differ, is an open set. So on that open set, you have a very natural definition of Dirichlet energy, which is the sum of the Dirichlet energy of the different sheets. What is going to be, on the other hand, the value of the Dirichlet energy on the closed set, which is the complement? Well, on the closed set, you can, of course, think that your function has a single value collapsed twice. And it's very easy to see that on this closed set, you are two times a classical Lipschitz function. 
Now, a classical Lipschitz function has its own Dirichlet energy even on a closed set, even if the closed set has positive measure. So this gives you a very natural definition of Dirichlet energy. But there is one problem. With this definition, it's extremely difficult to work. Essentially, this is the definition that Almgren has. Actually, he has a more complicated definition because he proves first a differentiability theorem. But nonetheless, it's quite complicated to work with this definition. So there's another way, which is a bit abstract, and which, OK, so now, of course, you could ask, what is a W12 space? Well, a W12 space I can define by relaxation. I take all Lipschitz maps with finite Dirichlet energy. I take any sequence of Lipschitz map, and I'm going to look at the possible limit of this map. Of course, I will need to show that if there is a uniform bound on the Dirichlet energy, this is converging somewhere. But in some sense, one thing that you could do is, once you have the Dirichlet energy, you could complete the space of Lipschitz map and create a Sobolev space. OK, so if you look into the literature, and this was our starting point when we be began to work on this. So there's another option. And the other option is to give you an abstract definition on a metric space of what is a W12 map, which is taking values on the metric space, starting from, from, from a Euclidean one. OK, actually, this definition was given independently by Ambrosio and Reshetniak in the 90s. You can do the following. So take a map F. Uh, which is taking, I mean, which is going from omega into a metric space. Now, you can build naturally a family of real valued map by looking at the distance of the value of the map f to an arbitrary point p. Okay, this gives you a real valued map. It's actually a composition of what you assume to be a W12 map with a Lipschitz map. Now, a composition classically of a W12 map with a Lipschitz map is also a W12 map. So you're expecting this testing to be a W12 map taking value on the real space. So your definition of W12 maps f are the maps f for which the L2 norm of this guy is less than infinity for every p point that you can pick up in your space x. But actually, you realize one thing. Since you're always composing with a distant function to a point p, which has Lipschitz constant 1, for a classical W12 map, this operation gives you not only an L2 uh, bounded gradient, but an L2 bounded gradient, which is uniformly bounded by some positive function. So you're actually asking that as there is a uniform control on this function here, and this uniform control is a function g. And in some sense, the Dirichlet energy is the best L2 bound g that you can find for all these gradients. Okay? So it's a kind of minimum. OK, that's the problem. If you define your Dirichlet energy in this way, and you go back to a classical vector-valued map, you're not looking the Dirichlet, en the Dirichlet energy that you usually pick. I mean, if you have a vector-valued map f, the differential df is a matrix. Now, the classical Dirichlet energy would be the sum of the squares of all the partial derivatives, which is the Hilbert-Schmidt norm of the matrix squared. If you pick this definition for a classical map, you will find not the integral of the Hilbert-Schmidt norm squared, but the integral of the operator norm squared. And that's not going to be good. That's not going to be good because if you have separate sheets, it will not give you the sum of the Dirichlet energy of the two separate sheets. So you cannot take this definition. But, and this is our work with Emanuele, there is a way of defining the Dirichlet energy intrinsically in this way. Now you have two, compet two competing theories. So one theory is very natural, it's geometric. Why it is very natural and it's ge geometric? Because if your map, if, you, if your two-valued map parameterizes a current, right? You have a geometric thing, which is the area, which is well-defined. And when you are uh, approximating, Taylor expanding the area, you will find the Dirichlet energy, which is exactly what I gave you in option one. But then you have another option, which is option two. There is no geometric uh, uh, kind of uh, justification for it. But on the other hand, it works extremely well to prove any sort of theorem in W12 or to extend any sort of analysis to this setting. Now, the very good thing is that options 1 and 2 are equivalent. So they give you the same energy. And this is the starting point of our work on de-minimizing functions. So now, what actually we are going to do is we are going to take advantage of both definitions. So, Compared to Almgren, there is one thing which is very valuable. That is, any time that we need to prove something which is a weak or soft uh, 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 Sobolev map uh, uh, property, 
Poincaré inequality, Sobolev embedding, trace theorems, whatever. I have a dictionary which translates my problem for an abstract metric space. So it's all going to be abstract nonsense. You want a trace theorem, it's an abstract nonsense. You want uh, Sobolev, it's an abstract nonsense. He actually had to work hard to get all of this. So there is one thing, however, which this abstract nonsense is doing and which does not seem, uh, he does not seem to have realized and which is extremely powerful, which is called gradient truncation method. It's a classical way to approximate a W1P map with more regular maps. So if you know it, uh, uh, you, you, you will understand exactly what I'm talking about. If you don't know it, uh, it's hard to explain. So let's see, for the one who knows it, what you are actually going to do, you're going to take the maximal function of the modulus of the gradient. And when you restrict your function to the sublevel sets of the maximal function, you find actually a Lipschitz bound. And this is extremely powerful because it allows you to apply all sorts of uh, real harmonic analysis techniques. So there is one thing, though, that by the nonsensical abstract theory, you cannot recover about uh, uh, what Angren is doing. And that is the only hard combinatorial part, which unfortunately we have not been able to, uh, to tackle with this theory. But we still have a simplified proof compared to what he has. So what you would like to do is the following. You would like to define a regularization by convolution of your maps. It's almost an hopeless problem, because when you hope to regularize by convolution, you, you hope to take integral in the target. The target is nonlinear, so forget about doing that. There is, however, a way, and the way is to take your uh, set of cutaples, which is a metric space, and abend it into Rn in a sufficiently large Euclidean space. You cannot embed it isometrically, unfortunately, but you can embed it in such a way that you have a bi Lipschitz transformation between the image and the thing. That's actually, I mean, it's still hard in Angren's uh, book, but now we have combinatorial proofs which are extremely neat of that. But to actually define what is a regularization by convolution, you need a projection from the ambient space onto the image of your uh, 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 metric space, which is in a neighborhood of, of, of this space, almost with Lipschitz constant equal to 1. Something for which actually you would need, in general, for submanifolds and C2 regularity. But in fact, your uh, 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 Lipschitz embedding into a large Euclidean space is only Lipschitz. So you will not be able to find something which is literally projecting in a neighborhood with the Lipschitz constant almost 1. And what you are actually able to do is to sacrifice the fact that it's a projection. So if you move a little bit the points, then you will be able to achieve that. OK, so we have a much simpler proof of this, although. But uh, one of the regrets of our uh, proof so far is that there is no way of recovering this by abstract theorem. OK, so now with the abstract nonsense of uh, 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 option two, it's actually very easy to prove that there is a minimizer when you fix boundary data. So that's, that comes for free essentially, from the Sobolev space theory, from the classical Sobolev space theory. But the regularity theory is where you actually have to work now, because the regularity theory is not going to be true in the general setting of W12 maps, which are taking values in a, in a, in a, in a metric space. It's very well known. Actually, classically, there are uh, 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 very beautiful theorems uh, 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 by Schoen and, 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 and other people that tells you that if the metric space is negatively curved, then the solution of the harmonic map problem is going to be sufficiently regular. But the space that we are looking at, it's not ne negatively curved. It's actually positively curved with positive curvature, which are Dirac masses. So anyhow, so what is giving you the two results of Angren? So Angren said the minimizer is Hölder continuous, first of all. And then secondly, we have a bound on the sides of the singular set. And we have this sheeting theorem. So let me tell you what is the proof of the uh, continuity result. Well, see, by abstract nonsense, it's again a Morey estimate together with, uh, 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 to, to, with a Poincaré inequality. If you integrate the Dirichlet energy of a minimizer and you have a decay, which is r to the m minus 2, so m is the dimension of the domain, plus a little something, then you are actually alpha Hölder continuous. Now, it's very easy to see that by a comparison argument with 
the zero homogeneous extension of the boundary data, if you have a minimizer, the minimizer has to be less or equal than 1 over n minus 2 times the integral over the sphere of the gradient of f squared. Now, if you look here, you have the integral over the ball. Here, you have the integral over the sphere. The integral over the sphere is essentially the derivative of this function. Okay? So this inequality over here actually turns out to be a differential inequality of this form. And it gives you a bound, which is almost for free, which is slightly worse than this guy over here. So you see, a tiny improvement of this is going to be the alpha Hölder regularity. And OK, so this tiny improvement is actually where you have to work somehow. But it's possible to do. Because of course, you can imagine that the zero homogeneous extension is pretty far away from being a good candidate, right, as candidate competitor. OK, so that gives you actually the, the, the um, continuity. But what does give you, I mean, what is the thing that gives you the regularity outside of a co-dimension 2 set? OK, so let us look at the modal situation. So essentially, you have a two-dimensional domain, and you have a two-valued function which minimizes the area. OK? So now, one thing that um, minimizes the Dirichlet energy. So one thing that you can do, which I already told you, you can take the average of the two sheets, which is going to give you a classical harmonic function, and you can subtract the average from all the values. Right? When you actually subtract the average, this means that the value of the map f is always going to be two values, which are p and minus p of x. So the points where you have two collapsed values is always going to be with two, two times the value 0. Okay? So you have a situation which is well-centered. Now, what would you like to prove? Well, obviously, when the two values are separated, right? so the function separates because I just proved it's continuous, and it becomes two separate harmonic functions, which is analytic, happy. So what is bothering me? The thing which is bothering me is a point where I take two times the value 0, but I'm not identically equal to 0 in a neighborhood. If I'm identically equal to 0 in a neighborhood, then I will be two times the classical harmonic function equal to 0. So my singular points are the points of collapse which, in which the entire function does not collapse. Now you could, of course, imagine the following. So harmonic functions have unique continuation property. If an harmonic function is 0 on an open set, it's 0 everywhere on the connected component which contains that open set. So now what you can hope is the following. I'm going to show you that if for a two-valued planar harmonic function, you have more than finitely many points where 0 uh, you have collapsing, then actually the function is totally collapsed, is identically equal to 0. That's the goal. How am I going to, go, going to prove this? I'm going to do it by a blow-up argument. So I mean, somehow, the blow-up argument is always going to be the first thing that you do whenever you do regularity of some geometric problem. I mean, first thing you do is you do a blow-up argument. So what can I do? Well, assume you have a point where you have uh, two collapsing and a sequence of two collapsing which are converging to it. I would like to study in detail the behavior of the function in the neighborhood of this bad point, where I have a clustering of bad points. Okay? So what can I do? I can do the following. I can rescale them up. So I can take a small r equal to 0, and I can zoom the domain and look at what the map is doing on the ball of radius 1. By zoom, zooming the domain, I have rescaled the ball of radius r centered at that point into the ball of radius 1. So now what I could do is the following. I could hope to normalize my function on the ball of radius 1 by dividing by the Dirichlet energy to the 1 half in such a way to fix the Dirichlet energy of this to be equal to 1. And then I can take a limit of what I got as r goes to 0. And hopefully, what I'm hoping is that the limit, as I told you by this thing which, which is called frequency function, what I'm hoping is that the limit is alpha homogeneous. Now, if I have a sequence of points of, of multiplicity 2, which is converging to this, I can blow up in such a way that uh, for subsequence, there is a point of multiplicity 2 sitting on the boundary of my disk of radius 1. Okay? Now, in the limit, by continuity, this is going to give you a point, a collapse point also for the limit. And since the limit is alpha homogeneous, this collapse point will, com will, will correspond to a collapsed segment. Now, once I have a collapsed segment, I just hope to show you that 
there would have to be the crossing of two harmonic sheets. And by hands, I will show you that it's not going to be a minimizer. OK, that is the program for the regularity, and it works. And here is this magic frequency function. So you see that there are two problems in these arguments. So one problem is that nobody is telling you that the sequence of harmonic functions, which has Dirichlet energy equal to 1 on the ball of radius 1, is converging to something in the limit which is non-trivial. Right? If in the limit I see the non-trivial function identically equal to 0, I gain nothing by this argument because I cannot have a contradiction for the function which is identically equal to 0. Now here you see a sequence of harmonic functions right, with energy equal to 1, which is converging to 0 in the interior. So the energy of these harmonic functions, which are higher and higher oscillations, it's all concentrated to the boundary. So I have loss of energy, which is converging to the boundary, although in the interior I have strong convergence. Now, how do I exclude this? Well, the solution is the monotonicity of this frequency function. So this is not going to happen in the limit, because when, when the monotonicity function is monotone, it will tell me that for the rescaled functions, this ratio is bounded. Now, if this ratio is bounded, you see that there is a reverse Sobolev inequality, which tells you that the integral of the Dirichlet energy is bounded by the trace, by the, L2, uh, 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 by the L2 norm of the trace. That is completely false for this guy. Because the L2 norm of the trace is vanishing on, on the ball of radius 1, on, on the sphere of radius 1. And the energy on the ball of radius 1 is equal to 1. OK, so the boundedness of this ratio, the boundedness of the monotonicity function, does two things for you. It gives you the alpha homogeneity in the limit, as I told you at the beginning, but it gives you another very important information. It gives you that the limit of, the, of, 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 uh, of any subsequence is going to be non-trivial because of this reverse Sobolev inequality. Notice that it's a very subtle argument because I will not gain a, a, a bound on this which is depending, uh, which is independent on the function f, right? So the thing is monotone, which means when I start from a certain Dirichlet uh, minimizing function, on the ball of radius 1, I have this quantity which is something. It might be a million. It might be two millions. So depending on the function that I'm looking at, for the zooming, I will have a certain reverse Sobolev. But I don't have a reverse Sobolev which is valid everywhere. So it's not like a Cacciopoli inequality for elliptic PDEs, which is always valid with an absolute constant. Anyhow. So how do we actually prove that, the mono, that this, this quantity is monotone? So there are two very important identities which you can prove as an exercise for classical harmonic functions by integrating by parts. I mean, this is one identity. So you recognize, you recognize immediately it's because f is harmonic. I'm saying that this df squared is the divergence of f times the gradient of f. And then I, 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 I integrate by parts, and I get this thing on the boundary. Now, of course, I cannot do this for multiple valued harmonic functions, because I don't have uh, gauss green. Actually, it's not true. We wrote a paper in which we proved that there is gauss green, which is independent of this theory, I mean, together with uh, Emanuele and another friend of us. But nonetheless, one of the important points for the Dirichlet energy is that this consequence comes from very basic first variations of the Dirichlet energy for which you don't need to write down a PDE to be derived. Okay. So I'm not going into the detail of this, but what I'm just saying is that it's a very robust argument, which is not using the PDE. It's using first variations of a certain particular kind on your energy function. OK, so we got step one of the program. Now we go to step two. So how do I approximate integral currents efficiently? OK, so here is a, 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 an integral current, a possible integral current. So you see, if I have a current which is a curve, for instance, in R2, it might go back and forth, right? So there are a lot of points where I am not a Q-valued map. So see, here I have one sheet, two sheets, three sheets, four sheets. So this bunch of curves is a four covering of the ball of radius 1. I would like to approximate this current with a four-valued map. But there are the pieces which are going back and forth. On the other hand, if you know that you have a Q covering of your unit ball down, and the mass of the current is not too far from this Q times the ball of radius 1, 
then there cannot be too many times that you go back and forth, right? So there will be a lot of points where you must be exactly Q values. Huh? Because if you were Q plus one valued, for instance, everywhere, then by a simple geometric consideration, the area would be at least Q plus one times the, 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 the area of the ball. Okay, now this quantity over here will be called the cylindrical excess. It tells you that the current not only is a Q valued covering of the ball of reduce one, but is extremely flat. Because to have this quantity which is close to zero, you must have the gradients which are very close to be planar. Otherwise, the area formula will tell you that you pick up too much area, okay? So now this will be the, the, the basic problem. And that is when that quantity is very small, you will be able to find a Lipschitz Q-valued map which agrees with the current except for a set down which is of very small measure. Okay, this is a pretty hard, actually, theorem in the, in, the, in, the, in the book of Algren, but this gradient truncation method that I told you can be combined with a very new technique in geometric measure theory, which is due to Ambrosio and Kirchheim and Gerard et Sonner, which gives you a bound on the set on which your multiple valued map are missing the current, which is related to the Lipschitz constant of the map that you want. And it's related by a very precise law. So if you want, I mean, if your excess is E, and you want a Lipschitz map with Lipschitz constant E to the alpha, you're missing a set of measure E to the 1 minus 2 alpha. And actually, this is really beautiful uh, uh, because Angren actually sweats a lot to get an estimate like this at the beginning, which is suboptimal, to get something like E to the alpha and E to the 1 minus 3 alpha. OK, on the other hand, what actually happens, if you remember, is that we need a very good approximation. So if you go then back to the, uh, I mean, if you go further uh, um, um, uh, with a fast forward and you want to get to step three, you will realize that you need uh, an approximation which is missing a set which is of order e to the 1 plus 2 alpha. So you actually would like to gain e to the alpha on the Lipschitz constant and e to the 1 plus something on the measure of the set that you are missing. OK, how could you hope to do that? Well, the way we do it is the following. So after we make a first approximation, the excess, the cylindrical excess, will look like the Dirichlet energy of your map plus higher order terms. So now, it actually happens, because I told you we have this theorem, that for a minimizer of the Dirichlet energy, the gradient is higher integrable. Now, this gradient truncation method would tell you that if you had an estimate of the following type, so if instead of the excess to be a measure of the L2 norm of the current, uh, of, 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 the, of, the, of the gradient, it were a measure of the LP norm, then you would actually get, by, by this estimate, uh, on the gradient truncation, this 1 plus alpha and e to the alpha. Okay? So this is the, the, the property that we have on, 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 on the Dirichlet integral. And in a sense, what we would like to do is to lift this problem, I mean, this, this estimate, to the current. So this is not that easy. I mean, it requires quite a bit of work. But there is a quantity that you can define on the current which is geometric and which looks like the LP norm of the gradient. And then by using the fact that you're close to an harmonic multiple valued function, you can prove a higher integrability estimate for this quantity, which then with the gradient truncation method gives you the better approximation that you were, you were looking for. OK, so now let us go to the center manifold. So how do I want to actually construct the center manifold, which is the average of the sheets? OK, so you have to think of this picture. So here you have, say, the reference plane. And you know that the current is essentially flat, or very close to be flat, with respect to this reference plane. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a Whitney decomposition of this, uh, uh, of this reference plane. So I start with a square. And I look at the square. If my current is very, very squeezed in this square, and if my excess is very, very small, I will refine the square into four. And then I look at the separate squares. If in the separate squares I'm very, very squeezed, 
and with very small excess, I keep separating. Now I keep refining, refining, and by this procedure, I stop at a certain point only if my excess is sufficiently large or if I am not too squeezed. And I hope to land into a Whitney decomposition of my uh, unit square. It will not happen. Because, OK, so here is, 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 is what I said somehow in words. So you're going to have two conditions why you stop the refining of the procedure. So you will, will, you will have the EX condition. So this ball B is a ball which has a comparable size to the size of your uh, square. And if the excess is too big on this ball, you stop. But you stop also if the height of the sheets got too big. Now there's a problem, though, and the fact is that you might land with a decomposition which is not at all a calderon Zygmunt or a Whitney decomposition because there might be a very tiny square which is close to a very big square. And usually when you're doing a Whitney decomposition, you hope that the nearby squares have always a compatible size. OK, so you need to adjust with the third technical condition to enforce this Whitney decomposition uh, property. OK, so now. There is also a region where you probably never stopped because you kept refining, refining, and refining. And at each scale, you were always very, very collapsed and always with the excess, which was very small. But on that region, you are a Q-valued function, which is Lipschitz and collapsed. That's not that difficult to prove. So now, essentially, what you would like to do is the following. So you have probably this region, which is actually not a bad region. In some sense, it's good, because you are completely collapsed, so you have a regularity for free. You would actually like, in the remaining squares, to find the average of the sheets of the current and to patch all of this into a single function, which is then going to agree with the collapsed function, which is on the, on the, on the collapsed region. Okay. So the way to do this is the following. On each cube where you stopped, you make, but this, you, you will have to make it on a suitable system of coordinates, which is maybe not the coordinates we started with, because maybe your excess was decaying, but with respect to different planes. So you will have to stop at that point and approximate with your multiple valued function. Then you will take the average of this function. You will have a classical function. Then you have to smooth it. That's what I said also in the first lecture. And then you have to look at the graph of this function in the original system of coordinates. OK, then you got, for each square, a function. And you want to patch all the functions that you got on these squares. And you do it this with a partition of unity. Of course, as long as you stay away from the collapsed region, you will be smooth. But as the squares are refining and refining, the partition of unity kicks in with the very high gradients and high, very high second derivatives of the functions that you used for the partition of unity. And possibly it's going to completely uh, uh, kill any hope of having a C3 alpha estimate in the limit. OK, so this is what I said. So the crucial and difficult point is to actually show that this function has a C3, uh, 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 a C3 uh, uh, K estimate. Okay. And what I said is that in the collapsed region, of course, the current coincides with the graph of this function. So now the center manifold M is going to be the graph of this function. Now the main estimates are the following. So essentially, when you are starting at a, I mean, when you're looking at a certain point C, at a certain cube, the cube was coming from a refining procedure. So the cube has a father, a grandfather, and ancestors, which were larger and larger cubes. And when you start off with the original cube, you had a possible approximation, which was giving you an average of the sheets, which is nice. And then by convolution, was going to give you a C infinity function, which is nice. Now, what you hope to do is to relate, at each refining, the C3 alpha norms of the function of good for the father to the function which is good for the son. And what you hope is to carry on an iterative estimate which tells you that the C3 alpha norm will not increase too much as you go to the refining, and you actually end up with a convergent series. OK, so that is doable. Now, once you have done that is doable, and OK, it's a very long uh, procedure. I'm cutting the story short, but then you have your center manifold. 
Now, at this point, although once you have the center manifold, you are faced with an important problem. So you have to approximate again the current with a multiple valued map on the normal bundle. Now, it looks pretty scary, but in fact, and, and I think this is not what Andren is doing, but this is what we are doing. What you can do is you can use in each cube the approximating map, Lipschitz Q valued map, with which you constructed the center manifold. Now, it exists. It's a very nice approximation, only it's approxim an approximation which is on the orthogonal coordinates, whereas you want to reread this approximation on your normal bundle on your center manifold. So essentially, you have an object which is good, but you have to change coordinates for it. And this is what I told you. Uh, this change of coordinates is maybe what makes our life much easier uh, than Andren in the construction of this approximation. OK, so when you look at this change of coordinates, you will get now a map which is taking values on the normal bundle. So if you, if you take a point x, which is sitting on the center manifold, you will have q values ni of x. When you sum to x the, 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 the value on the normal bundle, you're finding points. Okay? Now, most of the times when you do this procedure, you will see exactly the intersection of your normal line with your geometric object for most of the times. And that's because geometrically the approximation you started with in the normal coordinates was having this property. OK, now you're going to make the Taylor expansion of the area of the current, which I told you. And you find the following. So you find the volume of the center manifold. You find q times the integral over the center manifold of the uh, uh, mean curvature of the center manifold times the average of the sheets of the approximation. And then you find the Dirichlet energy. This is what you like. So now, why the blue terms are small? Well, this term is small because the center manifold is itself the average in the good coordinates. Right? So in the normal coordinates, uh, I mean, in the, in, the, in the tilted curve coordinates will not be the average, but it will be very close. So it's going to be a very small quantity. Now, this h is going to be also small because you have a C3 alpha estimate, so it's at least a constant. It's not bothering us. Now, why is this small? Well, this will be small because your center manifold M is still very, very flat uh, uh, in average if you started with a current which was very, very flat at your, at, at, at your uh, starting step one, okay? at scale one. So this is going to be a, a little O of N squared. OK, so now the main purpose of the approximation is to yield a, a new function which is well-centered. So you see. The average of n is very close to be 0, so it's much smaller than the average, of, I mean, than, than, than the size of the modules of n. So for this reason now, you hope that n is very close to not only a de-minimizing function, but to a de-minimizing function which already has the average of the sheets which is equal to 0. So you don't have to subtract the average as we did for the regularity theory when we had a generic multiple valued function, which was, the, the minimizing the, the, uh, the, which, which was minimizing the Dirichlet energy. OK, so in particular, you notice one thing. If your n is very close to an harmonic function, you can hope that your frequency function, which was monotone and harmonic multiple valued map, is almost monotone in this case. OK, why do I insist on this property? Because you remember. The monotonicity function had this very important consequence. When I was doing the zooming of an harmonic function, I was finding a non-trivial limit in the compactness theorem. And that was the monotonicity function, I mean the monotonicity of the frequency function, which gives you a reverse Sobolev. I want that. Why do I want that? Because I want a non-trivial limit which inherits the possible singularity of the currents and which will give me a contradiction to the regularity theory for the minimizers if the current I started with had too many singularities. OK, now it's not so clear anyway that this frequency function is monotone. It's actually quite a complicated uh, proof. What is the reason? So Anren would have this problem, which I told you, that this frequency function has a, de has a numerator, has a denominator, which is an integral over a sphere. And our Lipschitz approximation leaves a lot of holes of positive measure. So there might be spheres in which our function n completely misses the current. And the reason why you are almost monotone 
is because the current is a minimizer for a nonlinear version of, of the harmonic function. So whatever identity you proved for the harmonic functions, you hope to prove for the function which is not harmonic, not because it is only close to be harmonic, but because it's PDE in some sense. It's very close to be the PDE of harmonic function. Now, there is also another problem, and that is that uh, when you're actually looking at quantities which are close to the boundary of the ball over which you are integrating, the natural estimates would push you outside of the ball of integration when you are trying to, co to control error terms. That's not good, though, because you're trying to prove an almost monotonicity formula for this frequency function. You ought to actually control every type of error with the integrals over the given ball. So when you start being close to the boundary of the ball over which you are integrating, you cannot afford for errors which depends on what the current or the function does a little bit immediately outside. Okay? Okay, so there are the solutions to this. So one solution is this uh, 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 mollified frequency function, which behaves in a much better way than uh, the singular frequency function. And the reason why we can actually uh, absorb the error terms close to the boundary, it's this splitting before tilting phenomenon which I told you. And this requires a very careful domain decomposition, though. OK, so what is the splitting before tilting? OK, so we have two things. So, uh, there are, okay, so there are the cubes which were stopped for two reasons. Because the function was very separated or because the excess started to be small, is stopped to be small. OK, on those cubes, what happens is that the modulus of n is very large everywhere. And it actually happens that there is an estimate for area minimizing currents that tells you that if the current is sufficiently separated on a certain region of your ball of interest, it will have to keep being separated all over the places. So it's a basic L infinity estimate which dates back to, to Angren and Federer. So this will tell you, for instance, that if you are worried on controlling an error term on some given point here, with the difference between the sheets, uh, you can actually control it even if you're farther away. Now, this is already a splitting before tilting, but the most important splitting before tilting actually happens on the excess, uh, on the cube where you stop because of the excess condition. So, the general philosophy which I already told you is the following. S if you stop because of this excess condition, then the current cannot be too flat. And the reason why it cannot be too flat is because if the current at all scales were always being flat, then by compactness you would be very close to have a completely collapsed situation. And when you have a completely collapsed situation, the C1 alpha epsilon regularity theorem of the Georgi actually holds. So this actually tells you two things. At the scale at which you stopped, in some sense, the L2 norm of the function n is controlling the Dirichlet energy once again. So at that scale, you have a reverse Sobolev inequality. But you also have a unique continuation phenomenon which tells you that the L2 norm of n is comparable over different regions on this ball. So you cannot be too small in the L2 norm region over here, too flat, and be too large over here. So that cannot, that cannot happen. OK, so this is the reason for, for the splitting before tilting. Now, we have somehow, uh, we are at the very end. We, we have gotten our uh, uh, centered manifold approximation. Uh, so we have gotten uh, uh, a possible candidate limit, right, which is going to be a contradiction to the regularity theory for, a, for DIR minimizers. So you have got the monotonicity of the frequency function, which is telling you that this mini limit is not going to be trivial. It's not going to be identically zero. So now what you hope is the following. So you hope to say that if the area minimizing current has a too large singular set, there is a point P where I can make this approximation procedure where there are too many singularities which are clustering. When I make this approximation procedure around this point, the final limit function I ended up with is a DIR minimizer, and it has too many singular points, and it's non-trivial. And then I got a contradiction. OK, so 
as I said, the non-triviality of the limit will follow from the almost monotonicity of the frequency function. But there are still two very important hurdles. So the first one is actually, at the beginning, something that uh, uh, caused a lot of headaches to us. And it's the following, that there is, OK, so this is really for, for mostly for the experts. But there is something which is called very important open problem, which is called uniqueness of tangent cones. So although you are at a point where you know that at cert certain scales you're very flat, you don't know that you will be flat at all scales and always close to the same tangent plane. There might actually be a lot of holes in this. And if you were able not to prove that there were holes, you would be close to a very important statement in geometric measure theory, which is open since very, very long, which is the uniqueness of tangent cones. So your center manifold approximation cannot carry on over until the singular point in principle. So you have a center manifold, which is a good approximation up to a certain scale, but then there is a scale in which you stop to be flat. And then you're lost. You're in no man's land. You're not flat anymore. So you have to wait until at a certain other scale you flat again. And then you start your center manifold again. So there is not a single center manifold. There are many. Of course, the other hurdle is the convergence of the singular points of t to the singular points of your final blow up, blown up function. So what is going to save you actually for hurdle one? It's again the splitting before tilting. So the splitting before tilting phenomenon says the following. So assume your center manifold stopped. It stopped because you were not flat anymore. Then you are close to a tangent cone, which is sufficiently non-flat. OK, so now you let your scale go to 0, and you look at the first time that you are going to be flat again. And then you start your new center manifold. But the first time that you are flat again, you were coming from previous scales in which you were not flat. So the first time that you're flat again, you are flat, but not too flat. In particular, the denominator of the frequency function, right, which is the distance between the sheet, is going to be larger than an, absolutely, than an absolute constant. So your starting procedure gives you always a new frequency function, which is anyway bounded from above by an absolute constant. So your starting procedure is not going to hurt you the fact that you got a uniform bound for the frequency function, which is the important point to get a non-trivial limit. OK, so how I'm actually going to overcome hurdle two? Well, essentially, you can show that, in some sense, your current is converging to your function in the limit in a strong W12 sense. And when you have converging of a strong W12 sense, your functions are behaving extremely well, except for a set of 0 to capacity. But a set of 0 to capacity is a set of dimension m minus 2, essentially. So if your singularities were of dimension higher than m minus 2, they would actually create singularities of dimension higher than m minus 2, even for the limit, out of a relatively simple capacity argument for Sobler spaces. OK, that's actually everything. Thank you for your attention. Um, yes. So, for instance, one thing that you could phrase is the following. So, uh, we still, I mean, we still have to write this down, but we are writing this. So, chunks result, which tells you that you have finitely many singularity for two-dimensional area minimizing currents. It tells you actually that two-dimensional area minimizing currents are completely classical object. So, you are smooth, maybe analytic if your background metric is analytic like in the case of Euclidean space, and in the neighborhood of each of these points, you have a branching, typical branching singularity of an holomorphic function, essentially, of that type, plus higher order perturbation. So if you want, you could, for instance, interpret this uh, uh, by using Riemann surfaces instead of using uh, Q-valued maps. So uh, that's an example. And when you go out of the two-dimensional situation, is though pretty hard to, to, uh, to, uh, to get anything without uh, referring to multiple valued functions in some way. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you think your procedure might be more efficient if you minimize the absolute difference rather than use least squares? 
if I, sorry, if I minimize which? Minimize the absolute difference rather than using least squares. Uh, what would be the absolute difference? Oh, right, 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 right. OK, so for the distance. Um, OK, so actually, it's not so important what is the background metric that you, that you put on the, um, on, the, um, on the metric space. So you could use other distances than the Wasserstein distances. And if you don't take the abstract definition of the Dirichlet energy, which if you use other distances, then you will, you will not catch the uh, a geometric object which is the Taylor expansion of the area. So in other words, you can actually construct a theory of uh, minimizing DIR functions with another distance. You will get uh, good candidates harmonic functions maybe for some other geometric problem but surely not for this problem. And I have to say there are actually a lot of things in the regularity theory which are specific of having uh, the least square distance. So uh, I, I'm absolutely sure that the Sobolev theory is not going to be affected by a change of the distance, but the regularity theory might be. So existence of minimizers is surely not a problem, but for instance, continuity or the fact that you are separating nice harmonic sheets, which would be nice p-harmonic sheets, for instance, I think that is going to be uh, 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 probably a challenging problem.